Um, first of all, uh, my name is Josh Rowland. I'm a client success manager here at Meetup. And today we'll be hearing from guest speaker, Stephen Petro. He's the author of the new book, Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old. Uh, he's also a Washington Post columnist and the host of the Three Ways to Practice Civility TED Talk. Stephen will speak to us today about finding common ground across the age divide and making friends at any life stage. You'll learn how to build bridges with those you care about, how the pandemic changed our notions of friendship and how to deal with loneliness and disconnection. Now, before we get started today, I wanna to go over some of the guidelines and the agenda for today. So first of all, um, this event will be recorded today, but don't worry, you will not appear in the video and your audio will be muted the whole time. So you'll only hear the panelists. Also, the chat for the event will eventually be turned off but if you have any questions, we have a Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of the screen. So please submit any questions using that feature. We also have closed captioning available today. So on the bottom of your screen as well, you'll see a live transcription icon. You can select your preference for closed captioning from there. All right, and with that, I would like to introduce Stephen. So Stephen Petro is an award-winning journalist and a book author who is best known for his Washington Post and New York Times essays on aging, health, and civility. He's also an opinion columnist for USA Today, where he writes about civil discourse and manners. Stephen's 2019 TED Talk, Three Ways to Practice Civility, has been viewed nearly 2 million times and translated into 16 languages. So Stephen's latest book, Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old, has just been published. Um, also, he's the former president of NLGJA, the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. Stephen, so happy to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. Josh, it's great to be here. It's great to be with all of you. And I think you're the first host who's ever managed to say NLGJA without like slipping over it. And what we call it in the organization to make it easier is negligee. So, okay. <laughs> Got it. I'll know for next time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, obviously you have this new book, Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old. Um, and let's talk about it. Why did you write the book? Uh, what inspired you? And why was now the right moment to write it? So I started working on this book when I was uh, in my early 50s and my parents were in um, their 70s. And I wanted to just do a call out to my sister Julie and her wife Maddie who I believe are among the 1.4 participants today and I think my niece Anna and I was so I was watching them get older and I saw them starting to do what in my head I was calling stupid things you know, I was kind of the firstborn I was the smart ass uh, you know I knew everything and I wasn't going to do it like them I was going to stop driving when I started hitting things but my mom didn't I would, um, you know, I would pick up the rugs when my dad started falling over them, but my mom didn't. And this just kind of became like a longer and longer list. Some of them were sort of in the funny vein like that, although the driving one was kind of serious. Um, and some were more substantive about uh, thinking about what's coming next and how to break through the denial. Um, my father was a journalism professor and he had always from a young age taught me about the subjunctive. And so, if this, then that. And so at one point we we're having a conversation. He said, well, if I were to die, and I said, no, dad, that's the wrong use of a subjunctive. You know, we're all gonna die when I die. So, um, so there's a bunch of things like that. And, um, but the point was really for me to chart out a better course for myself to make fewer mistakes or to make different mistakes. And this then wound up becoming a New York Times column because a lot of what happens in my life seems to wind up in print or digital. And it really resonated with readers. It surprised me. It had a less snarky um, uh, headline in print. It was things I will do differently, but it was on the uh, most read list for two weeks. And then what really surprised me, Josh, was that hundreds of people began sending me their similar lists. And I thought, ooh, something's going on here. We're a generation that's gonna to try to make changes, do better. And the book was really born from all of our lists. So I, in, a, in a way I say I'm, I'm speaking for a generation. That's so interesting. Um, I think I've always thought of it as every subsequent generation wants to try to do better at that sort of thing. But you think there's really a focus on this particular generation? Well, I think every generation in the boomers of which I am one, 
certainly thinks that it is the generation and the boomers have not been shy about that in any way. Um, but most generations kind of feel that way. So, you know, as I'm making that passage, it's on my mind. So that's really why the why now answer, excuse me. Cool. Um, okay, so I know our audience, we, we love tips and tricks here at Meetup. So what are your top do's and what are your top don'ts when it comes to friendships, happiness and life in general? So that is, that is a great question. And so the first, the first answer I would have is get out of your rut and try to change things up. And I, I certainly found as I got older, I got more comfortable doing things the exact same way. And the story that comes to mind is I had a Jack Russell Terrier for a long time and I would walk that lovely terrier wrist as I called her because she had all the um, wonderful and terrible attributes of a terrier. But we would walk the exact same path every single day. And it was without thinking. And then I went to a yoga class and um, my friend and teacher, Amy Gorley, she decided she was just gonna start changing things. And she sat in a different part of the room. We had to sit, we were next to new people. My head was the wrong way, the wrong way. But the whole point of that was to begin to get us out of our comfort zone. And so I found that actually when I started walking the dog in a different direction, I met new people, I saw new things, and it really kind of brought home that metaphor uh, to me. So, you know, get out of your rut. Um, you know, another one is about humor. And there's a lot of humor in this book on purpose because there are topics here that are, that are hard to talk about. And some of them are, you know, aging and illness and disability and, and then death. And those are topics that we don't like to talk about, we're afraid to. And so humor is, is, is just so powerful. And uh, I had cancer when I was in my 20s, I was 26. And I remember going into Memorial Sloan Kettering and I was scared about the surgery, but instead I focused on the low cotton thread count of the sheets in the hospital. I had, you know, I was a little bit sort of off target. And I remember the nurse told me, she told me very firmly, you know, you really need to focus Stephen on what matters and the sheets do not matter. And then she said, and they're 100% polyester. And so, you know, that was a really good example of like bringing humor into, into a situation and, and into an area that where you might not normally think that you would find it. And I, I remember when my mom who had terminal lung cancer and was actually treated at the same hospital, she would be, read the obituaries and then she would start saying, well, you know, I've outlived everybody. I don't know any of these people, I'm, I'm dying. And she said, I'm dying today. And she was kind of a dramatic person, I said, okay, mom, so if you're really going to die today, I'm going out to get the shopping for dinner tonight. Does that mean you don't want dinner? Oh, what's for dinner, Stephen? So, you know, again, um, some humor. And um, the last one is about changing our perspective. And so here's the story, Josh. About 10 years ago, I was at a um, retreat center and I got lost in the fog. And I had seen the moon sort of leading me in the right direction and then it disappeared. And I started turning around and turning around and I just got more and more lost. So I didn't know what else to do. So I kind of just walked 10 feet and then I saw the moon and the moon took me back to where I needed to go. I got, I got found. And that was very profound to me that sometimes we think, you know, here we are and we can't find our way. But if we change how we look at the world, if we change at our, you know, our feet even, we may find the path that we need to take. So change your perspective. I love that. Thank you for those stories. I especially love the, the stories about the humor. I think we, um, we often forget how useful it can be at those hard times in our lives. Um, so the next question I have for you, I wanna ask, uh, we all know that there is uh, differences when we're making friends at different life stages, but mm -hmm. I wanna hear you since you're, you wrote a book about this, what, what do you think are those differences uh, when you're making friends at different stages in your life? And do you have personal experiences that kind of taught you about those differences? So I do think, I do think it's, it's different. And I think that as a generalization, I would say that it, it can become harder over time, but that's really not the only answer. Uh, 
for those who are who are younger, and I think you know, your age, uh, college, post college, um, first couple of jobs. I don't know how old you are, but um, things are much more fluid, and people do not have the same kind of established circles. And one thing I you know I see with my nieces who are in college and other young people, everybody is seeking to form a community, so they're much more open. And then as we move along, we get friendship circles, we get professional circles, um, we have children, you know, all of these life matters happen and our worlds kind of become more constricted. Our time is definitely more constricted. So it becomes challenging to, to open those up. And um, so one of the things I found, so I'm, I'm a gay man, I do not have kids. And I remember in my forties when it seemed like all of my friends had had children at that point and there the structure of their lives changed you know we weren't going out to dinner anymore at nine o'clock because they needed to get home and they needed to feed the kids and they were tired and so i had to adapt if i wanted to maintain those friendships and deepen those friendships and that meant learning to like family dinners which i did learning to eat much earlier and uh, kind of going with that flow, but this ability to adapt is is really important, and um, you know, and one of the things that I think we can pick up on to uh, create these friendship networks when we um, when we're struggling. And I don't know if something might have happened here. So sorry, I had some kind of technical difficulty, but I think I'm back. Okay, uh, did you were able to hear me? Yeah, I heard up until that very last part. Um, so apologies for that. Um, but if you, if you finished answering, I can go on to the next question. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my next question was many feel that it becomes difficult to cultivate new friendships as we get older, like you kind of alluded to. So have you found that to be true in general? Yes. And, um, you know, I answered a little bit of that, um, in the, in the last question. And I think, you know, what's really key is to find new ways to meet people. And I'll tell you, look, I got divorced four years ago. I'd been in a, in a partnership and a marriage for 14 years. And most of my friends, most of my network were married couples, which was great. But I wanted to meet, I wanted to meet new people and I wanted to meet people who might've been unaffiliated um, in part for dating, but in part for friendship. And so I found I needed to do new things. And this is, this is not a paid solicitation, uh, but I joined a number of meetup groups in, in my area, an LGBTQ group, a hiking group, a kayaking group, um, and, then, and then some other groups. And what I really appreciated about these groups were how diverse they were. And it also seemed if there was one characteristic that defined people in these groups, it was that they wanted to make new friends and were really open to making new friends who were different than themselves. And that has that ended up being um, you know, just kind of a lovely um, way to do it. And of course, there are all kinds of other ways to do it um, other than meetup, but um, but that's that's one that I know everybody who's listening knows quite a bit about. Yeah, thank you for the shout out. I mean, we definitely, we, we see that working here that the people who come to meetup are people who are really open to making new friends and looking for that. And I think that's kind of the beauty of it is that everybody's really open to finding a new friend. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know that ahead of the time. So that was really my experience. And um, so it's, it's been great. That's wonderful to hear. Um, okay, my next question for you, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your answer. So mm -hmm. friendships, uh, they're often considered second rate relationships. I think a lot of people believe they're, uh, you know, second to familial or romantic relationships. So where do you think that attitude came from? And I think you probably would advocate for it to be changed. And if so, how can it be changed? So I think that when, let's well, speak for myself. When I was younger, it was very easy to make friends um, based on interests, so on, activities. But there was there was this hierarchy, and then you know, you know, well, do, do you like him or her? Well. You know, they're just a friend, you know, which is like sort of the worst put down when you really think about it. Um, but I think, you know, and I, I think folks who are listening here will, will understand that when you have been friends with someone for years or even decades, 
they really become embedded in, in your life. And many of our friends will stay with us longer than our partners or our spouses. I, um, you know, I had a very long um, marriage of, of 14 years, but I, I'm friends with people who have known me since I was a child, since college, graduate school. And these are people whom I, I really value and whom I really feel known and valued by. And, um, you know, and so this commonality of history is, is really a great um, bridge to the future. And, you know, and more and more, I think that we, we want our friends, we want to incorporate our friends into, into our lives. And so in a way, um, they may be as important, if, if not more important. And one lesson I've learned is that you can't get everything from one person. But from a group of friends, you can get almost everything, not everything, but. Uh... I love that as well. Yeah. I, and I think the, the larger our support network, probably the better off we are in general, right? Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, and then as people, you know, have um, challenges, you know, deaths and families, illnesses um, and so on, this, this network of support is, is, is just crucial. And, um, and so you really get back what you put in. And I think that's kind of a, a core equation of, of this, not to make it transactional, but um, this sort of um, quid pro quo. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so my next question for you, kind of related to friendships, you know, uh, but also just growing older and keeping an open mind. So how do we keep an open mind as we get older? Do you have any tips? Um, and I know you also shared with me before uh, we hopped on today that uh, you might have a section from your book that is related to this that you'd like to read from, right? Yes. I was just taking a quick look at the, the questions that have been coming in from, from folks out there. But I'm, I'm, there are a lot of them, so I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna get lost in that. I'm gonna let <laughs> Jane, <laughs> Jane do that. Questions, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna read this one, this one part of a chapter. And um, the title is, I won't limit myself to friends my own age. So um, some of Denise Kessler's best friends were 30 or 40 years younger than she. And I happily counted myself among them. When we met in 1993, she was 77 and I had just turned 36. You could say I was her Harold, a young man bored with his life, but obsessed with his death. And she was my Maud, an old woman living life to its fullest and charged with vitality. Talk about a mismatched couple. Denise chose me. Initially, I assumed she picked me solely based on my FICO score since I had applied to rent the garden apartment beneath hers. But I came to understand fairly quickly that becoming a tenant of Denise's was one step to becoming a friend. Few made the cut, but those of us who did had one thing in common our age. Sure, Denise had some septuagenarian friends, but as she once told me, she had little patience for old people. She was 77 when she said that. <laughs> she also had little time for them or anyone, and she struggled to find an hour to interview me for that first interview. Her days were chock full, water aerobics in the morning, copy editing the local paper later in the day, attending street demonstrations anytime, writing letters to the editor often, and donning her wig to join her feminist sisters in the last hoorahs, a cheerleading brigade, an authentic barefoot hula tap troupe, as the San Francisco Chronicle reported on them. And they would perform at birthdays, graduations, and other parties, always exiting to a standing ovation. And she did this until she was 93. Uh, she lived until she was 98. Uh, Denise did have blood relatives, but she wasn't especially close to most of them with the exception of her granddaughter, whom she adored. And she had her own definition of family. To paraphrase tales of the city novelist Armistead Maupin, Denise created her family of logicals rather than rely on her biologicals. And Maupin later entitled his memoir, Logical Family, explaining that sometimes your biological family won't accept you at all, and you have to form your own circle of friends and loved ones who are logical for you. So I will stop with, with that quote, but, um, but I think um, Armistead really brings up a very good point about who we consider family and how we 
you know, and how we constitute that. And so this notion of, you know, biologicals, these are the people we were, we were given, you know, at birth through blood, so on and so forth. Sometimes they don't, they don't meet our needs and certainly sometimes they don't meet our needs as friends. Uh, but by expanding that definition and allowing us to, uh, you know, make choices, um, we then have, you know, these logical friends and these are people based on similar values, shared interests, uh, history, experience. And so um, I hope that people will start to, you know, kind of expand in their own minds who is eligible for, you know, for close friendship and for um, feeling part of your family, um, however you want to define that. Because I think, I think that will give us much greater um, breadth in all of that. Absolutely. Um... So, so getting down to the nitty gritty, do you have any, you know, more concrete tips for keeping that open mind as you get older? Yes. Um, so there's kind of um, this war of the generations right now. And, you know, we all, we all wear our hat. What generation are you? Oh, uh, millennial, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. You have a millennial hat on. I have a boomer hat on. There are Gen Z people here. There may be even someone from the greatest generation. And I think those labels separate us, first of all. And then there's often like a lot of um, sniping about who who is at fault for this or that. And the OK Boomer from your people, Josh, you know, is a great example of uh, kind of uh, a snark directed at boomers, but I have to say, as, as a boomer, um, we are largely responsible for the world that you have inherited and the and the the challenges that um, that you are all inheriting. Um, but those are not really helpful in connecting. So um, I think uh, I think this notion of being a perennial, and perennials um, are beautiful people who can be any age, and so. You can be a perennial um, at your age, someone at 50, someone at 80. And a perennial is really um, an individual who stays passionate, who stays connected, who keeps blooming year after year in sort of vibrant color and doesn't get weighed down so much by the, um, the hard aspects of, you know, of living. Um, certainly there are the hard aspects, but um, there's a brightness in perennials. And I think that when we can start to identify a little bit more like that, we can also find ways to get past the labels that, that keep us apart. Um, so part of that is just don't be judgmental about other, other age groups and seek to find um, the benefits of having these, these um, cross-generational um, friendships and relationships. And, um, and then science plays into this as well. So there's been a lot of um, data and I love data and I love science. And, people who have cross-generational relationships have happier lives, have fewer health problems and tend to live longer. So there's some real concrete benefits for all of us kind of getting out of our silos and, um, and extending our friendship webs. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm curious from the opposite perspective, can you maybe share some tips on what a Gen Zer can do to start a friendship with a millennial and vice versa and what I mean, you mentioned some of those benefits. Um, mm -hmm. Can you go a little more into what those benefits are, like a little more in detail? Well, the um, so I mean, some of the some of the benefits are, are the ones I just talked about about and, and very you know concrete of better health, better mental health, um, a longer life, and those are probably the three you know the three greatest gifts that, that one might be able to get out of this, and. Um, but for, for younger people, for Gen Z people, you know, this is a great habit to get into when, when you're earlier. Um, you know, we talk about all the negative attributes about um, older friends, older relatives, and we tend, we tend to not talk about sort of the greatest attribute, which is experience, experience and, and its cousin wisdom. So you know, these, are, uh, these are benefits for, um, for younger folks who find ways to, um, to connect with with older ones and um, you know so as to the practical part of that uh, 
I'm very intentional these days. And that is, that is something that I have learned over time. I, I would not have said when I was in my 20s or 30s that I was intentional at all. I probably wouldn't have been, even have told, been able to say exactly what that means. But I try to understand what my values are, what matters to me, and then I try to implement them in, in how I live and in the decisions that I make on a daily basis. And one thing I often do is when I'm, when I'm posed with a specific challenge, my initial reflex may not actually follow that course and I'm, I'm aware of that. So I will sort of pause. And this is something I've learned in, my, in a meditation practice. It's called a sacred pause. You don't have to call it a sacred pause, but it's just like taking a breath and saying, what decision do I wanna make here? Do I wanna do this? or do I wanna do that or, or, or something else? But giving it a little bit of both thought and heart as a way to, um, you know, to make your intention come work for you. And so, you know, in family gatherings, you know, that may mean striking up a conversation with that relative, um, with that aunt, with that uncle, not waiting for them to do it. It may mean putting down the phone for just part of that time uh, so that uh, you can be present in the room with them. But it's, it's more about being open inside to having those connections and then also appreciating that there's something to be gained by having conversations and connections like that. And, you know, for instance, with my friend Denise, you know, I was in my, I was in my thirties and she was in her seventies. You know, I, I saw how much life experience she had. And, and I'll, I'll tell you this, Josh, you know, you sort of think, oh, well, she was like a grandma figure. She really wasn't. I had, I had um, two wonderful grandmas, but um, I remember it was my first house and I was with a startup and the, the people came to trim the tree in the backyard. And I was on a conference call, I was too busy. And so, um, I came out at the end and they practically just cut down the entire tree. And so I called Denise up and I said, Denise, this happened. I feel terrible. It's breaking my heart. And I thought she was going to say, oh, it's, it'll be all right. It'll grow back. Um, she said, the lesson is you need to show up for what matters to you. You should have been out there. It's kind of harsh, but it was really true. And, um, you know, that's something that, I, that I've taken away my whole life. When, when I'm in a situation where being present matters, I hear her voice, do it. Wow, uh, she seems like such a, a wonderful figure. Um, and I think you've done a great job of not painting her as grandmotherly, but uh, as a, someone very vibrant, you know. Um, she always not... called her hair purple when she would see me, Josh, because that, <laughs> uh, that was the way she wanted to stay visible as an older person also. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, we've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic for, uh, a long time now. And, uh, I think a lot of people have experienced changes in their friendships during the pandemic. I'm certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you, how would you describe those changes? Um, how do you think the pandemic has really affected our friendships? I think significantly and, um, do you mind if I ask you a little bit how, how yours have changed? Um, yeah, like no, I, I would say it made me reevaluate some friendships um, and more so because I am not, I have never been the best person at keeping up friendships that are not, uh, you know, where I can't meet them in person. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a long time, I really couldn't see my friends in person. And so that made me think about, you know, my habits as a friend um, and of, trying to get better maybe at that electronic communication, but also realizing that maybe then was not the time to work on developing a new skill. And so saying, you know what, if I can't keep up these friendships right now, you know, maybe they'll rekindle later and some of them have now that I can see them again, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, I'm just not the person, I can't be there for those people right now. And those friendships just won't happen anymore. You know, that is, that is what I hear from, from most people and that, the pandemic was a time to reevaluate how we're going to spend our time and how and with whom we're going to spend it. And you know, for the reasons that you talked about and that almost all of us experienced, you know, we couldn't be 
physically in person. And um, it kind of caused um, us to create the pods. And these, are, these were our closest friends or, you know, or logical family members. And those pods were, you know, by definition, fairly, fairly narrow because of the risk of, of contagion. And so we kind of hunkered down. Um, I think, you know, through Zoom and, and, and other means, we did stay connected. But, you know, after a day of doing Zoom calls for work, I only, I only had like a limited um, bandwidth to do more Zoom with friends. And so I did create a hierarchy, you know, in my head of those I really wanted to invest um, the time with during that time. And, you know, when I, when I, when I look back now on the pandemic, I'm going to see that those relationships really deepened and they grew in a way I would not have um, imagined possible. You know, and then coming out and, you know, so, well, it's so interesting coming out. Let's just say it was a month ago when we were coming out of, of all of this, you know, we're kind of many are bursting with let's get reconnected, you know, in person. Um, uh, and yet there were still others who were, you know, I want to manage how I'm going to make this transition. I want to take some of the lessons about authenticity and, and true connection you know, from, from the pandemic and, and apply it to, to this new world. So there has been, you know, kind of, um, I don't know if it's a shedding of friends, but the seasonality of friends in terms of we're now in a little bit of a different place and I have different needs and I have, I have different intentions that, that I want to live by. And so many, many friendship circles are kind of um, a little tenuous these days. And, you know, I've made some decisions in my head and I've seen some of my friends or my former friends make some decisions you know, in their heads about, you know, how they, how they want to connect. And um, I don't think there's anything, I think this is actually healthy uh, because it does allow us to, to be deeper. And I, I was a person who had, I mean, on LinkedIn, I have, I can't tell you how many, I mean, I have 2000 connections on Facebook. I have, I'm at 4,900. I could only get, you know, and those are not my friends, you know, and I, I want things to matter to me. I think people want things to matter now that they've, now that we've come out of this experience. And I realize as we're talking about this, you know, I'm talking about it as though these were the before times and who knows what times we're really in right now with, with the variants. So that's a little bit of a, that's very confusing for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we're going to be going through some, some ups and downs and, and it will continue to, you know, work through it. Um, yes. But as, I, you know, obviously this is a, a continuing uh, pandemic. And so a lot of people are still dealing with loneliness and social isolation, especially older people, you know, people who are immunosuppressed or might not otherwise be able to utilize the vaccine to its fullest extent. So um, how do those people, you know, deal with it? What are, what's your advice uh, from the research you've done? Well, I'll just start with this. If you're not vaccinated yet, please get vaccinated if you're able to. And um, sure, kids under 12 are not able to. Certain certain individuals are not. But one of excuse me, I think one of the lessons of this pandemic is that we need to think more about the we than the me, and that applies to friendships. Um, and it, it applies to, to public health. You know, we're, we're getting vaccinated uh, as individuals, but we're doing it for our families, for our communities. We're doing it for our country. And um, this has also become a very divisive topic um, among, among friends. Uh, that, that being said, among older people, the studies that have come out in the last couple of months show that loneliness and social isolation has increased dramatically during during the past year. And that has been very challenging um, for, for these people. Do I say for these people like, um, that is not me. I have experienced that too. And, um, you know, I, I live in a community where I have people near me, but I, I live by myself, many people live by themselves. And so it's hard. Um, and, you know, there, there are specific things that you can do. And the first one is to acknowledge that you want to have more connection. That's sort of the start. 
And then, you know, I had planned to get a dog uh, sometime next year because I had that, that Jack Russell Terrier that I was talking to about earlier had died before the pandemic and I've never been dog free. Well, I have a pandemic puppy and there are many pandemic um, puppies and other pets around the country. And they've been you know, very helpful to, to people in, especially during the, the darker times about having this kind of companionship and having you know, a, a living sentient um, being with you. Um, moving on to the two-legged variety of, of connection, you know, here again, I think it helps to um, to have an intention and to be focused. And I'll tell you the story. So before the pandemic, I had two different friends and they started this practice of just kind of like, I don't know if it was randomly calling people, but they would, they would pick up the phone, you know, they would, you know, most of us sort of hate the phone of these days, but they would actually call and just say, how are you? And it was a way to say, I am thinking about you. And if something is on your mind, let's, let's talk about it. And um, I found it very connecting. And I started doing that um, in, a, in, in a couple of different ways. I would pick up the phone and if I thought from someone's, you know, Twitter, Twitter posts or other, other posts that things were hard, or I knew that they had had a loss, you know, I would I would just pick it up and, and and talk to them. I also started a gratitude practice, which I think people can do. It's 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 very simple. It's it's free. And what I do at the end of the day is I write down three things in, in a little journal of what what I was grateful for that day. And um, and now, if it's a human being, I will express it to them. So people get these texts from me. You are on my gratitude list, and they go, oh, "What's that?" And <laughs> but, but again, you know, I think when we understand that someone is thinking about us, um, we start to feel connected. And then there's this, there's this wonderful um, psychologist at Stanford. Um, his name is Jamil Zaki. And he's done a lot of research on kindness and empathy. And so he has really like two main theories. The first is we're not born one way or the other you can develop skills to be kind and to be empathetic as you can become also um, unkind and un unempathetic. So, um, so that's, that's a beautiful thing in its own way, but he's also shown that if I am nice to you, you are more likely to do something nice or say something nice to someone you know. Um, it might not be the same thing. It probably wouldn't be the same thing. But there's kind of um, a little bit of a magic of what happens, and he, he calls it, um, you know, this virus of kindness, which is, um, you know, which can go viral. And so, you know, the more that we all can do these things that um, are helpful, show kindness, show connection, it breaks down that loneliness and that social isolation. And then, you know, you you kind of wind up with. I don't, I don't like military metaphors. I was going to say sort of an army of, um, you know, kindness warriors. There must be a better way to say that, but I think you know, you know what I mean. Um, all, all these people who are, you know, practicing kindness. And um, you know, here in my, in my town, there's a, there's a lovely woman and she's a um, textile artist. And in the middle of the pandemic, she created these calendars and she put her art on each page. And then she went through town and she delivered hundreds of them to people. And then people started passing them along or passing cookies along. And it was a real tangible example of not only the giving, but breaking down those walls that, that sort of lead us to feel that kind of, that kind of loneliness. Yeah, I, I loved your advice um, specifically about picking up the phone and calling people, uh, which is something people in my generation, if I call you know, one of my friends who's my age, they might think I'm dying or something. Well, uh, <laughs> I know. And I mean, I, I was, I was wondering whether, I mean, well, first of all, I told you, cause it's true, uh, but I am, I, I am allergic to the phone. Um, so either someone has died or it has to be a really special reason. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think it's, it's, it can be nice to hear the human voice. Now, all of, I think these ideas can be, you know, adapted in various ways, but we're so used to getting texts and 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 you know uh, direct messages that we just don't focus on because so yeah absolutely um okay so 
I just have a couple of questions left from myself here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to say, I see that people have been asking great questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will be getting to those in just a few minutes. So looking forward to, to reading those and seeing what you have to say, Stephen. Um, sure. But before we get there, um, I wanted to ask, I know that for many in the LGBTQ community, there are unique challenges when it comes to aging that cisgender and heterosexual people might not be aware of. So can you discuss some of those with us? Yeah, and I'll just remind everybody that I'm that I am I am a gay man, um, and I've done a fair amount of research on, on this too. And uh, it is, I think it's um it can be especially challenging for queer people as as they get older, and it's for a number of reasons. You know, we've only had marriage equality since 2015, which is you know the institutional legality of marriage, and um, so our families certainly have not had that, um, that kind of structure um, embedded in law. And um, there are various stats that uh, uh, queer people tend to have fewer children than, than cisgender heterosexual people. Some have, are estranged from their families of origin. And then there's a whole generation of, of, of men and women who grew up through the AIDS epidemic and really lost um, their cohorts. And so they kind of get to this, this point post midlife of not having the same connections, not having the same structures um, and finding themselves you know, alone. And then some of those people who go into, you know, whether they're continuing care communities or retirement homes, uh, they face discrimination. and a good number of them wind up feeling that they have to go back into the closet because they really don't feel safe being out with their identities. And you know, some of them have been pioneers in the LGBTQ civil rights movement. And now here, you know, they're in these, these homes where they're afraid, they're afraid to be themselves. And you know, that seems to me one of, um, one of the, the worst possible insults to anybody. Um, so there really, there are, um, you know, and there are, but there are new communities forming. Um, we're talking more and more about these these issues. There's a wonderful national organization called Sage. It's based in New York, but they have chapters everywhere. And um, Sage, for example, excuse my using this word, they have meetups. Um, they probably, I'm sure they call them something different because I'm sure that's trademarked. But they have meetings, um, you know, in person um, around various topics and interests and. Um, uh, so you know those are those are real practical ways to um, to get connected, and there are also some, you know, some residences for queer people that um, they may be all queer, or there's some certifications now that say you know we are queer friendly, and um, so that's much more inviting. Yeah, I think it's really valuable for for younger and middle aged people to you know hear about that advice uh, for queer people. To hear about that advice because it's like you said uh the aids epidemic really did knock out uh, nearly a whole generation of people so to see you know elderly queer people who have managed to keep those those bonds and still be out um i think that's really valuable i appreciate you sharing thank you, um, thank you for asking me yeah um okay our next question so this is our last one before we go to uh the questions from the audience so you've said that loneliness and social isolation many are feeling these days is one of the greatest challenges that we face individually i know a lot of our audience feels that way um, but also we face it as communities so what do you mean by that and how do you build bridges with those you care about and with those you disagree with as well so before i answer let me just say to those who are um, who are listening um, in the q a if you care to put down some of your ideas about how you have tried to work through some of the loneliness and social isolation. I think that'd be great for all of us to see. I'm, I'm imagining that there's a real hive mind here of great ideas. There'll be some commonalities. There will be some outliers, but um, I, I'd love to see that um, if, if you all can do that. Um, but you know, to, to this point, you know, I started this book trying to find ways to help people talk about the topics around aging. 
but I found, um, as I've talked about, uh, talked about the book in, in various groups for the last two months, that that is kind of, um, it's either a microcosm or it's a metaphor for how we talk to each other at this time in this country, in this culture that is so polarized. And you know, so some of the lessons I take from the book, I think have applicability to the larger challenge before us. And you know, that is, how do we understand those who are different? How do we begin to connect with them? And you know, part of, you know, part of my answer on how we begin to connect is to take away the labels. And I was talking about you know, Gen Z and millennial labels, but take away the other labels, take away the blue state label, the red state label, um, the anti-vaxxer label, you know, take away the labels and find, you know, and find ways to, to talk or text, um, but to be also vulnerable. You know, there's, there's, there's fear, whether you're quote blue, red, purple, about where this country is going. Um, we have fear for our families. We have fear for our health. Fear is, is almost universal. And to acknowledge it, I think, also allows us to become closer to, to others and to sort of exhibit a vulnerability. You know, in, in, in these conversations, you know, that you see online or on the cable networks, there's no vulnerability. You know, people are just so certain in what they say, what they feel. And that is so, you know, unpersuasive when you're thinking about the heart and how to bring hearts closer together. Um, so in that way, I, I think the, the lessons of this book have, you know, have larger applicability. And, and, and the way I have, have come to see that is people in, in groups such as this initially told me that because I, I hadn't actually sort of thought about it in, the, in that broadest way. So, um, so that's in part why I wanna see what the Hive says here, but it's been really instructive to me to see how um, you know, being open, being vulnerable, and seeing individuals for, for who they are can just be such a powerful catalyst for friendship and for um, breaking down that loneliness and social dislocation. Yeah, I love that. Um, okay, I wanna make sure we get on to our audience questions here. So um, the first one I'd like to ask you is from an anonymous person. They said, what factors do you find destroy friendships as we age? And I don't, destroy sounds like a little harsh to me. So maybe we could say threaten or, you know, diminish because I, I feel like it's usually not one big thing, but maybe a lot of small things, right? Or, or you know, cheating on, on a friend's spouse might be the specific answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could definitely destroy a friendship. I think the, you know, the challenge to friendships as we age is that we change and um and we you know we grow and we grow at different speeds and we our interests may shift and um you know i think about i think about i'm thinking about a friend i had when i was much younger and we were like this and but i'm i'm so imagine two railroad tracks but they weren't exactly parallel they were just a little bit askew but you know they look very close, but then you kind of move through time and those tracks, they go like this. And so I think that happens in friendships. Um, and I think part of, uh, part of um, how we respond to that is accepting that, you know, we do change, our interests may change. This person may not be the right person for this season and there are times to let go just as there are times to acknowledge that and see if you can rekindle, refine you know, a common core that um, that really acknowledges a history that you may have had. Um, but no one says we we're going to have, um, you know, a spouse for life and no one's guaranteeing that we're going to have friends for life. Thank you. Um, okay, on to the next one here. So this is from Mary Jo Pence, or Ponce, sorry about that. Um, and they asked, is it possible to educate others to be open-minded? Um, if so, how? And I assume part of that is buy your book and give it to them, right? But there's probably- some You would never do a hard sell like that, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so the question was, can you teach others to be open-minded? Yeah. So um, Mary Jo, I'm wondering if you're a parent or a grandparent or, or an aunt or an uncle, because I, um, I think about that question sort of in context of our family relationships where we have an enormous opportunity to be role models. 
and to show those around us how we choose to live, how we choose to connect, um, you know, and so on. So I think modeling the kind of behavior that we would like to see in others is one of the most important ways that we can convince, cajole, sort of push someone along because often I have seen people in my life who exhibit values that I don't have. And I think, wow, I wanna be like them. I wanna to try to be a little bit more like that. And, um, and then I'll try because I'm, I see that it's working for them or it's something that I emulate or appreciate. All right, thank you. Um, so next one up is from Valerie Martin asking how, or can you talk about how to realize who really qualifies as eligible for a close friendship? That's an interesting question. Um, so, I, so Josh, I'm wondering like in your world or in your brain or your heart, do you, you know, do, do you have different categories? Do I have different, do we all have different categories? Um, I don't think like, I don't think mine are that um, labeled, but I do think there are, um, there are hierarchies and same, same for you or, or different for you? Somewhat the same. I feel like I've seen, you know, the graphs and studies saying like, oh, you can only have four close friends right. at one time. And, and so that gets in my brain, but I, I do think more that it almost sneaks up on me sometimes. And I'm like, oh, now that person's my close friend, you know, and oh, now I'm, I've become so much closer to this person. And it's more of a, a fluid, ever-changing type of thing, if, if slowly, at least. Uh, and I don't really like stick the labels on and, and, you know, really like think about them a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, so there are these studies and I don't think you could possibly have more than like 10 or 12 close friends according, according to, the, to the definition, but, I think you know the question we want to ask ourselves is, am I giving to this person what they need out of a friendship? And am I largely getting what I need out of out of that? And it, that will be different for um for different for different levels of friendship. And I, I recall like one of the most hurtful things to me when I was in graduate school. I had a friend who I thought was a close friend who told me she demoted me to a level three friend. I didn't even know there were level three friends then. <laughs> and um, so now she's a level three friend on Facebook to me. <laughs> so I, ha I have talked a lot about intention and trying to live my values. I am a real person. And, uh, and so maybe I need to do a little more work on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I I'm not holding a grudge. <laughs> Well, it's okay. I know you said earlier that all 2000s of your Facebook friends were not actually friends. So you immediately got unfriended by like 50 people who were watching. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I want to go on. Uh, we have one other question I, I really like here. Uh, Jennifer Persibali asks, what advice do you have for people to be more like Denise? Ah, uh, well, I want to say a word about Jennifer Percivali because I know her, and Jen, I'm going to cry because. Um, so Jen is not someone I have spent a lot of time with over the years, but we have worked together, and um, we have we have lived through difficult times um, on parallel tracks, um, and I had some losses, and she lost her her brother several years ago. And I, I do think that when you can be there for each other, especially at those times that are so challenging, um, that's, that's, that matters. And Jen has been there for me at those times and I have tried to be there for her. Um, that doesn't answer Jen's question, I realize. And um, so how to be more like Denise, who, um, who was a perennial. Uh, it's about retraining your brain and, um, and saying, I am going to live large and um, I'm going to have an expansive world and I'm going to take risks. Um, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to um, 
pay attention to those ruts and, and change them, sort of many of the things that we've been talking about. She's almost really the um, embodiment of, of what I'm trying to do in, in this book. And, um, and, uh, and she, lived, she lived a great life until 98. Thanks, Jen. All right. Um, really appreciate you answering all those questions from our audience. Um, and with that, I think we're going to move on and close out the show here. But um, please, everybody, give a virtual round of applause. And before we go, I'd like to just share a few slides. Um, so Janine, if you could put the slides up. Can I say goodbye? Absolutely. I want to say thank, thank you to you, Josh, and thank you to the whole team you know, for having me. Um, thank you to Jen for uh, inviting me initially. Um, it's really been a, a great pleasure to work with you all and what you do. Thank you. Thank you again just for, for coming on. Um, it's been so nice. So um, while, while we get those slides up, um, I think we got to let you pitch your book one more time. Um, so to buy a copy of Stephen's book, you can go to kensingtonbooks.com uh, and there it is on the slide. Um, so honestly, after this conversation, um, I think everybody should be buying it. We all should be more open-minded. Um, it really, uh, thank you for writing about this topic during this time. I think people will find it very valuable. And there's a special discount and free shipping if you order it through kensingtonbooks.com. Love it. Um, okay, and I think, I think Janine is also posting um, our, our special direct link in the chat. So please check out the chat for that. Um, all right, so also we wanna share our own discount here. Um, you can find others who share your interests and save 30% on your first organizer subscription to become an organizer with Meetup. So go to meetupsavings.com if you're interested in becoming an organizer and starting your own group. Um, also, we wanted to share um, that we launched our podcast. It's called Keep Connected. It's with Meetup CEO earlier this year. Um, and please take a moment right now, take out your phone, scan the QR code and give it a listen. Um, as a reminder, just before we go, I wanna let everybody know you can view a recap of this event in a few days on our Community Matters blog. That's at meetup.com slash blog. So go check it out. Um, if you, you know, want to recap some of what we talked about or maybe send it to a friend, you can do it right there. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you for all your great questions. Uh, it was really nice reading that. Um, and thank you one more time for Stephen um, for joining. And I hope you have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank Take you. Bye-bye.